Welcome back to Mind and Reality. We're already on lecture four, good for us. Our topic is cognitive penetration. So it would be good to start with the question, well, you know what question I wanna start with. What is cognitive penetration? This is also one of the three questions that you will be asked on the seminar task. And just in case you're in a hurry, I'm going to answer it right here, uh, appealing to the research by Firestone and Scholl. So if you need to answer that seminar task in a big hurry, there you go. Thank you, Steve. Firestone and Scholl say that to say that vision is cognitively penetrated is to say that our beliefs, desires, emotions, actions, and even the languages we speak can directly influence what we see. You still with me? Okay, great. <laughs> Let's have a look at some cases which would not count as cognitive penetration. The first thing is this, uh, perhaps I'm in a live lecture and Aisha raises a hand and I might say, I see Aisha has a question, inviting her to speak. Now this is clearly a case where my beliefs influence what I see. After all, if I didn't believe that we were in a lecture, if I believed that we were in an auction, for example, I wouldn't believe that Aisha has a question. I believe that she wanted to place a bid on the valuable painting I was auctioning. That's actually a very nice thought. Perhaps we should do that sometime. Um, so, so you might say, look, this is a case of cognitive penetration. But of course, you, you'd be wrong there because the notion of seeing that Firestone and Scholl are working with and the one that I'm working with includes, it excludes cases like this. This would be what we might call seeing that perceiving that something is the case. Really, it's just a way of thinking. We use the verb see here. It's here, here's the verb. We use the verb see here, but we're not really talking about perception. We're talking about things based on perception. Very good. Another thing that we want to rule out is this. Uh, you say to me, Steve, Aisha's behind you. I turn around and I come face to face with Beatrice. Now I turned around because I believed that Aisha was behind me. And because I believed that Aisha was behind me, I came to see Beatrice. Without the belief, I wouldn't have seen Beatrice. So this is a case where my belief influences what I see, but it doesn't count as cognitive penetration because it isn't appropriately direct. Now, whenever you see the word direct, you're always gonna ask the question, well, what would count as direct? What would count as indirect? Really, this is a sort of metaphor, and it's gonna be quite difficult to spell that out. I'm not sure indeed how Firestone and Scholl might do that or how you might do that on their behalf. Uh, however, I think it's good enough for present purposes because you can see that it clearly is supposed to rule out this kind of case. My belief that Aisha is behind me does influence what I see, namely it influences whether or not I see Beatrice. I wouldn't have seen her otherwise. But that's not a case of cognitive penetration because it doesn't count as direct, whatever exactly direct means. Okay, good. So we've seen that there are two cases of not cognitive penetration. I just hope that helps us to understand the definition here a little better. We should also take note, as Stokes says, that there is no single uncontroversial definition of cognitive penetration. Different researchers have used different definitions. It's not really clear that they're equivalent. If you're interested, Stokes actually discusses several of these, McPherson, Polition, and others. Um, and, you know, we, we can't be absolutely sure that we're not speaking at cross purposes, as in so much philosophy. But I don't propose to spend a long time defining things. I want us to get down to business. To that end, it will be helpful if we step back and think about perception. Now, if you've been following along in order, You've already done some thinking about perception. But there's a very important aspect of perception that we haven't considered so far at all. And to illustrate that, I want to use a case study, one of my favorite cases studies, the case of object tracking. So I'm gonna show you a little video. It's just a 17 second video. And if you look very carefully, you might be able to see a red dot in the center, somewhere around here. I can't actually see it, so I'm sort of pointing, hoping for the best. What I want you to do is very simple. I want you to fixate on that dot, okay? Do not let that dot leave the focus of your gaze, but 
when the video starts, you're going to see that some dots flash. And I want you please to keep track of where the dots which flash are. Okay? So keep your eyes focused on the central circle at all times. But doing that, while doing that, please keep track of the dots which flashed. Okay? It's going to take 17 seconds. Let's go. So, I wonder about this dot here, the one right by, oh, right by me here. Is that one of the dots that flashed at the beginning? What about this one? Is this one of the dots that flashed at the beginning? Or how about this one up here? Did that one flash at the beginning? Were you keeping track of that dot? Now, what Scholl and Politian found in their classic study based on earlier work A replication of earlier findings in fact, was that humans generally are able to keep track of around about four simultaneously moving objects. Very interesting. Our perceptual systems enable us to keep track of moving objects. You might think, Steve, that's not very interesting. But it's the basis for something, well it is interesting actually, <laughs> to me anyway, but it's the basis of something even more interesting. The first thing we want to acknowledge is that one of the functions of perception is to track objects. Perception isn't just about surfaces arranged in space and the way that they reflect light and so on, the smells of things and the rest. It's also about the movements of objects. So perception involves time. But importantly, your information as a perceiver is often incomplete, perhaps always incomplete. It's very common indeed that you only have partial information about an object. So you might imagine, for example, that you are kind of trying to keep track of a cyclist. Somebody has stolen your bike, uh, she's jumped on your bike and she's cycling away furiously. It's Aisha actually, I should, should have not taken any notes of her earlier. Uh, she's cross because we didn't take her question. Anyway, she's cycling away furiously on, her bi on your bike um, and what she does is she tries to lose you by, you know, cycling through some trees and such so that you only rarely catch glimpses of her. But from the glimpses of Aisha, you try to put together a picture of where she is, where she's moving and so on. So you can sort of head her off and get your bike back. Uh, and it's a happy story. You do get your bike back in the end. And Aisha's very contrite and apologises for her terrible behaviour. Now, uh, here's the um, carefully controlled analogue of that for uh, the purposes of an experiment. What I want you to do again is to Fixate on the centre point, if you would please, and then I will ask you to keep track of dots which flash. Any dots which flash you're asked to keep track of. Ready? 17 seconds, go. Now what you should notice here is that although the dots disappeared behind what we might imaginatively call barriers, you were probably, like most of the subjects in Scholl and Politian's experiment, nevertheless able to keep track of their movements. So I hope that worked for you, but even if it didn't, the important point is just that in experiments, subjects will reliably keep track of moving objects even if those objects are temporarily hidden from view by barriers. And if you're interested, Scholl and Politian have a whole variety of different conditions where they're investigating what sort of factors will interfere with the ability to track moving objects. Our interest though is just very, very abstract relative to theirs. One of the functions of perception is to track objects, but your information is often incomplete. Despite this, you, like all humans, most humans, can track objects pretty well, even on the basis of really quite incomplete information. Well done you. The question of course for us is, how is it that humans do that? How do humans keep track of these objects?
And the answer, I think, is that it must involve some principles of object perception, or if you like, a little theory about object perception. So what we've just seen is that perceptual processes take as inputs not just the sensory information, which is after all available only when the objects are visible in our object pa tracking paradigm. No, perceptual processes also rely on some principles governing the way the objects behave, or if you like, a background theory. The theory will include things like objects move on spatio-temporally continuous pathways. So those will be both inputs to the perceptual processes, which then enable you to track objects. Now this is a lovely, very simple picture. The important point to gather here is that perceptual processes can't rely entirely on sensory information because that information is often fragmentary as where an object disappears from view temporarily because something is in front of it. Now our question is what can go into the principles or background theory that your perceptual processes rely on? Is it that this is in some way limited so that there is a proprietary set of principles or a background theory which is used only for vision and nothing not already part of that theory can be into vision? Or can you put in here anything that you believe or no. If you can, then it would seem that we have cognitive penetration. If you cannot, then we have an absence of cognitive penetration. Not anything you believe or know can be what influences the background theory, which together with the sensory information gives rise to object tracking. So this question here is really the question of cognitive penetration. So to sum up, what is cognitive penetration? My suggestion is this, sensory, inf sensory inputs provide incomplete information about objects. Perceptual processes fill in some of that missing information in accordance with principles specifying how objects behave. Our question of con cognitive penetration is this, can anything at all that you know or believe be used to fill in that missing information? Or are there limits? Is there, if you like, some body of principles or theory which is proprietary to the perceptual systems so that information outside that proprietary body is not able to influence your object tracking? That, I suggest, is a good way for us to think about the question of cognitive penetration. But you may not like that, and you don't have to go with my idea if you don't want to. You can take somebody else's, as long as it's a, you know, a serious researcher who's thought deeply about this. And that's certainly true in the case of Firestone and Schott. So if you want to, you can use the definition that they offered you, which we saw at the beginning. What you have to remember, though, is that, as Stokes says, there is no single uncontroversial definition of the target phenomenon. So we need to be sure that we're defining cognitive penetration in such a way that discovering that there is or that there is not cognitive penetration will be a matter of some significance. Significance, right. That brings me to our next question. Why should we care about cognitive penetration at all? What significance 
with the conclusion that there is or is not cognitive penetration. Yeah.